I welcome everybody to uh, this uh, webinar, uh, Opportunities for Stronger and Sustainable Post-Pandemic Growth in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, this is the fourth time that the LSE Latin America and Caribbean Center has had the privilege of hosting the Inter-American Development Bank's report on the Americas. The second time that we've done so remotely and the first time we've done so in collaboration with the LSE School of Public Policy. My name is Gareth Jones. I'm professor here at the LSE uh, and director of the Latin America and Caribbean uh, Center and will be the chair uh, of this uh, webinar. Uh, just to please make note uh, that this event is being recorded and technology uh, permitting, we hope to have a podcast version uh, available through LSE uh, channels in the usual way uh, in the next few days. Uh, we, you can also uh, uh, tweet uh, of, about the, the webinar uh, through the hashtag, uh, hashtag LSE uh, post COVID. Um, I'm now going to uh, introduce uh, the sort of first phase of the panel, as it were, uh, Susanna Morato, uh, who's pro-director of research uh, at the LSE, Mr. Malcolm Gia, uh, the IDB's executive director for the United Kingdom, and Dr. Eric Parado Herrera, uh, chief economist and general manager of the research department of the IDB. We'll say a few words, and then I'll come back in and introduce the main speakers uh, and the discussants. Uh, Susanna, uh, over to you. Thank you, Garrett. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to this virtual event. As Garrett said, I'm Susanna Morato, and I'm the Pro Director for Research here at the LSE. In 2017, uh, the London School of Economics and the Inter-American Development Bank formalized a partnership through an MOU led by LSE's Latin American and Caribbean Center. And the partnership aims to jointly deliver research and organize seminars, conferences, and other activities related to the advancement of Latin America and the Caribbean. The partnership was formally announced at the first event organized by the partners back in October 2017 and opened by LSE Director Baroness Manu Shafiq. This inaugural event focused on the IDB's flagship publication, Learning Better, Public Policy for Skills Development, as a starting point for exploring the obstacles and opportunities related to the region's skills gap and expanding debate on this topic at the global level. Since then, IDB has launched its annual Latin American and Caribbean macroeconomic report for the academic community at the LSE. And as Garrett said, this is the second year the report is presented online, and I'm delighted to be part of the event. I also wanted to highlight that today's IDB LSE panel forms part of LSE's Shaping the Post-COVID World initiative. Building on the important conversations and research being undertaken here at LSE as part of our COVID-19 response, which includes many projects funded by our COVID-19 Rapid Response Fund, our COVID-19 Policy Response Event Series, LSE COVID-19 Blog, and many other outputs across the school, are shaping the post-COVID world initiative is convening a debate about the direction that the world could and should be taking after this awful crisis and what policies national and global actors should pursue. We have an opportunity to help shape the new normal in line with our LSE strategic ambition to be the leading social sciences institution in the world and also the one with the greatest global impact. So in today's IDB LSE panel, we have Inter-American Development Bank speakers discussing their 2021 Latin American and Caribbean macroeconomic report. This 2021 report was prepared by a team of economists under the direction of Eduardo Cavallo and Andrew Powell from the IDB research department. Its aim is to offer a set of policies that can help policymakers to implement a stronger post-pandemic recovery for the region. If you are interested in reading the IDB's 2021 macroeconomic report, or indeed in the LSE Shaping the Post-COVID World Initiative, you can find the respective links on the Zoom chat. And with that, it is my pleasure to turn over to Malcolm Gear, who is the Inter-American Development Bank's Executive Director for the United Kingdom. Malcolm, over to you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, let me start by thanking Susanna, Gareth, and the staff of the LSE for hosting this event. As Gareth said, the Inter-American Development Bank has a tradition of presenting its annual macroeconomic report in the UK, which is a reflection of our ongoing and deepening partnership, as well as the value placed by the Latin America and Caribbean region on its links to UK academic institutions. 
Over the last 10 years, the UK has tripled the number of chief innings scholarships awarded to Latin American applicants. And for many years, LSE and UK academics in general have participated in the IDB's network research program with top academic institutions in Latin America and the Caribbean. I wanted to take the opportunity to say a few words about the UK, Latin America and the Caribbean and the Inter-American Development Bank, of which the UK has been a member for over 30 years. In 2020, the IDB demonstrated its ability to provide rapid and substantial countercyclical finance to help its 26 Latin American and Caribbean member countries manage the immediate impact of the COVID pandemic, approving over $21 billion of new operations, a considerable increase over the previous year. As the largest multilateral financer in Latin America and the Caribbean, the IDB is an important platform for delivering UK priorities in the region. These priorities were set out in the Canning Agenda by then Foreign Secretary William Hague, with the aim of reinvigorating the UK's relations with Latin America. And they are as relevant today uh, to today's vision of global Britain as they were at that time. Of course, one of the UK's highest regional priorities relates to climate change and our COP26 presidency. We're encouraging the IDB to use its resources and its policy influence to help countries build back better from the COVID crisis. As I speak, The Minister for the Environment at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, Lord Zach Goldsmith, is in Colombia for the Letitia Pact Summit of Amazon region leaders as they discuss measures to address deforestation, including the IDB's new Amazon initiative. Foreign Secretary Liz Truss visited Mexico last week at the end of her first overseas visit in her new role. Incoming COP President Alok Sharma has recently visited South America and the Caribbean to understand firsthand the opportunities and challenges Uh, the countries there are facing in the fight against climate change. And our COP26 ambassador for the Americas, Fiona Clowder, is currently visiting 13 Latin American countries to promote positive social and economic change in line with a green recovery. This latter point is important. The UK experience since 1990 is that economic growth and decarbonisation can be achieved in tandem. And we've been working with the IDB to demonstrate that this is possible in in the LAC region too. Uh, I'm using the abbreviation LAC for Latin America and the Caribbean. Phase's sustainable infrastructure program has enabled the IDB to unlock transformational reforms that will accelerate the transition to a net zero economic model, such as last year's energy or renewable energy auction in Colombia, or that or the country's hydrogen roadmap that was launched last week. DEFRA's sustainable agriculture program enabled the IDB to pilot new approaches to agriculture in Brazil that not only reduce soil erosion and greenhouse gas emissions, but increase productivity and competitiveness. For this reason, I'm particularly pleased to steer readers towards chapter nine in the report that Andrew and Eduardo will present today, which demonstrates that if the right policies are adopted, then there is no trade-off between climate and growth objectives. IDB research provides concrete evidence of this. A joint study by the International Labour Organization and the IDB found that countries can create 15 million additional net new jobs by 2030 if they advance towards a net zero uh, a net zero emission economy. The IDB provided technical support to Costa Rica to develop its national decarbonization plan with a huge potential net economic benefit of 41 billion US dollars from decarbonizing its economy. Chapter nine concludes with a set of policy prescriptions under five pillars of decarbonization, by which Latin America and the Caribbean can achieve carbon-free prosperity. This kind of analysis demonstrates that the added value of the IDB is not solely financial, but derives also from the knowledge and technical support it can provide to policymakers in the region, and its ability to draw on best practice and expertise from non-regional members, such as the UK. The IDB has been a pioneer amongst the development banks in providing support to countries to strengthen and implement their national de- nationally determined contributions in line with the Paris Agreement, and it's well placed to work with countries to develop their own long term strategies. Costa Rica is one of the few countries of the region so far to have developed a long term strategy, and this has prompted interest from other countries in the region. A country's long term strategy maps out an economic growth trajectory that is aligned with the Paris goals. This crucially brings the country's decarbonisation plans into the purview of the Minister of Finance, making it easier to assess whether new investments are consistent with the 1.5 degree pathway and to develop a pipeline of investable projects. It also enables governments to identify the fiscal risk associated with the energy transition and develop a green fiscal strategy to reduce and manage it. The IDB has played a key role in facilitating this decisive shift in ownership of climate change and nature from environment ministries into finance ministries not least 
through the creation of a regional platform of finance ministers for climate action, uh, which we can expect to see launched formally uh, at the COP summit next month. Uh, there is, of course, much more to the report than the one chapter on climate change, and it's with great pleasure that I will now pass the microphone to Eric Parrado, who will formally introduce the report, uh, the coordinators and the presenters. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and, and thank you very much, Gareth, Susana, Malcolm, for your initial remarks. I'm Eric Parrado. I'm the Chief Economist and General Manager of the Research Department of the Inter-American Development Bank. And in that role, it's my great pleasure to join this virtual presentation of our 2021 flagship Latin American and the Caribbean Macroeconomic Report. I'm very happy that we have been able to organize this, and I particularly want to thank the LSE Latin American and Caribbean Center the LSE School of Public Policy and the IDB's European Office for this excellent initiative. I hope this will be a regular annual event in our calendars because it provides us with the opportunity to discuss on the risks and opportunities that lie ahead of the, for the Latin America and the Caribbean region with a distinguished audience and assess how the bank can support its borrowing countries through its newly launched development plan called Vision 2025. This year's report is titled Opportunities for a Stronger and Sustainable Post-Pandemic Growth. This year's report is probably the most comprehensive and ambitious report of the series. In part, this is a response to the current exceptional situation, as these are perhaps the most challenging times facing the region. The idea was to provide an assessment of what has happened, but perhaps most importantly, to provide a set of concrete policy recommendations. And there is no doubt that the region will emerge from the COVID-19 crisis poorer, more indebted, and with economies that will look very different in terms of their productive structures. This year's macro report covers more than the standard macroeconomic issues because the magnitude of the challenges that countries face are significant on multiple fronts. Yes, we need fiscal, monetary, and financial policies to preserve stability and to boost sustainable and inclusive growth. And we covered those topics in the report, but we also need reforms that will help reduce informality, address low productivity, enable small and middle enterprises to invest and grow, hire more workers, export more, and build a stronger economies. We also need to boost growth and making it more sustainable. We cannot forget the growing climate crisis, even as we deal with the coronavirus crisis. The report contains chapters on each of those additional issues treating them with equal rigor. This COVID-19 crisis began to unfold as countries were already facing a complex set of pre-existing conditions, including low levels of productivity and simmering social discontent. I presented this year macro report to the Inter-American Development Bank governors in the IDB annual meeting in Barranquilla, Colombia earlier this year. It helped us to start a conversation with governors about the risks and opportunities that lie ahead in the road. As I mentioned before, on how also the bank can support its borrowing countries through its newly launched Vision 2025. I hope that today's presentation will further contribute to that endeavor. Thank you very much. I'm back to you, Gareth. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you, Malcolm and Susanna. Uh, it's now my great pleasure to introduce the principal speakers and uh, the discussants uh, for uh, the webinar. Uh, firstly, uh, Andrew Powell, uh, who's principal advisor uh, in the research department at the IDB, holds a, an, a BA, an MPhil, and a DPhil from the University of Oxford, uh, has been a lecturer at Queen Mary College London and the University of Warwick. Uh, he was chief economist at the Central Bank of the Republic of Argentina and professor at the Universidad de Cuarto de Tella uh, in Buenos Aires, uh, also Argentina. He's been a visiting scholar at Harvard University, at the IMF, and at the World Bank. Eduardo Cavallo is principal economist at the research departments at the IDB. And prior to joining the bank, Eduardo was vice president and senior Latin America economist for Goldman Sachs in New York. He's also worked for the Center for International Development and been a member of faculty at the Kennedy School of Government Summer Program at Harvard. We're also joined as discussants uh, by uh, Mala Tukaran, who's an economist, a specialist on the Caribbean, where she's well known for her work monitoring 
regional development and country level economic performance and for leading discussions on the implications of global geopolitical developments for the Caribbean. Marla has been a key influencer in public private sector engagement and decision making and a leading voice in the call for to reduce gender and income inequality and to improve the resilience of economies through the introduction of fiscal responsibility frameworks. Andres uh, Velasco is Professor of Public Policy and Dean of the School of Public Policy at the LSE. Before joining us in London, Andres was Minister of Finance for the Government of Chile for 2006-2010 and Professor of Practice in International Development at Columbia University, among a range of academic appointments. He has advised several international organizations and appears regularly in the media. Uh, before I just hand over the microphone to Andy uh, to present uh, the macro uh, report, I'd just uh, like uh, the audience uh, remind them that uh, if you have questions to please type those into the Q&A function at any time uh, during the presentations and I'll try and ask those, collate them, ask them uh, to the presenters or the discussants uh, at the end uh, of uh, the session. If you could please keep comments and questions as short as possible and if appropriate include your name and affiliation. Uh, with that uh, the microphone passes to you uh, Andy and Edouard. Thank you so much and uh, good evening everybody thanks to uh, Gareth, Susanna, Malcolm and Eric for those uh, excellent introductions. It's a real pleasure to be able to present the report um, uh, to you today, and I want to thank everybody who was involved in organizing in organizing this event, both at LSC and also our European department of the, the IDB. It's a shame it's virtual, uh, but uh, that's the world we live in, and I do hope we can re uh, resume physical events in the near future, and, and as Eric says, make this an annual uh, uh, physical event. Uh, this report was written um, a couple of months ago, but we continue to update and uh, the data and the projections uh, that are in it. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your point of view, the main issues uh, that we'll talk about uh, certainly remain um, highly relevant um, today. We're only going to produce uh, uh, present a short summary of the report today, as time permits. Um, and as Eric said, it's a very ambitious report. Uh, and, uh, you know, so feel free to download it from our website. Uh, um, and we'll be happy to interact with you later if that um, is appropriate. I had the pleasure of coordinating this uh, report with Eduardo Cavallo, um, and we've divided the presentation between us uh, this evening. So I will talk first about the impact of the COVID crisis and um, some of the selected implications and I will cover the fiscal, monetary, and financial developments to some extent. And then Eduardo will summarize the main recommendations of the report to focus on the more structural aspects, um, some of which that Eric already uh, touched on. Unfortunately, Latin America and the Caribbean was one of the worst affected regions in the world by the COVID crisis. Uh, you can see that um, by looking at um, just the population and the death rate and, and, and the deaths. Uh, Latin America and the Caribbean roughly has 8% of the global population, but during 2020 accounted for more than 25% of total deaths uh, due to COVID-19 in the world. On this graph, you can see that with, there's no real trade-off. There was no real trade-off between saving economies and saving lives, or in other words, countries that suffered more in terms of deaths per capita also lost more in terms of economic output and, and vice versa. And unfortunately, many countries in the region were at the bottom left of this graph, or in other words, the wrong part of the graph. They suffered more in terms of both health and economics um, in terms of the recession. Uh, probably they suffered more in terms of health because of the weak health infrastructure in many countries and the patchy enforcement of lockdowns. And on the economic side, due to some initial conditions such as low growth and fiscal constraints which led to relatively small uh, fiscal packages in some cases, also because of high levels of informality and insufficient connectivity to um, uh, work, at, work at home. Some countries, of course, suffered more than others. Tourism dependent countries were particularly hard hit in terms of economic output. So they actually lie above the line. You know, they were hit more by 
uh, in terms of economics than they were by, by health. Uh, and, and, and of course, some of those countries are in the Caribbean, and I'm sure Marla uh, will touch on those in the, in the, on that topic in the discussion. There are other countries in the region that suffered more in terms of the health outcomes rather than the um, economic outcomes. That includes Brazil, Chile, Colombia, and Mexico that lie below the line. I'm glad to say now that new cases and deaths are falling in, in most countries in the region and vaccination rate programs are proceeding, although the speed of those programs is, is definitely very mixed. Um, Chile and Uruguay stand out as the star performers with more than 70% of their populations fully vaccinated in both countries. But on the other extreme, Central America and some countries in the Caribbean, vaccination rates continue to be low and there's considerable challenges. Unfortunately, the crisis implied deep losses in employment and an increase in inequality and in poverty. In an IDB working paper, the simulation suggests that extreme poverty may increase from just over 12% to 14.6%, and moderate poverty is also projected to rise from under 12% to about the same figure, 14.6%. So only a strong recovery is going to allow those uh, rates to decline significantly. And indeed, the social issues that have plagued the region, such as inequality, uh, both act in terms of outcomes, but also in opportunities and low quality public services will surely come back uh, and already coming to the fore in, in some countries again. Now, when we published this report, we employed a baseline consistent with what was then the IMS baseline uh, projections from the World Economic Outlook, I think from April. The IMF had a projection of 4.7% growth for the region uh, this year, and then reverting back to trend. But as, you, as you're all aware, there's, there's a lot of difficulties making such projections, and especially at the current time, with a lot of uncertainty. So we were particularly worried about a negative scenario where vaccines were even further delayed or dangerous new mutations provoked new lockdowns. Luckily, most of this did not um, come to pass. We also noted a considerable upside risk, particularly given stronger than expected growth in the US and also recovery in, in China. We said that inflation fears could though pick up, which might then force the Federal Reserve to revise its patient stance on monetary policy. Um, it may start to limit asset pur purchases, sometimes referred to as tapering, and start to think about increasing the policy interest rate. We said that this might then prompt a financial market correction. But we said that if that correction was relatively mild, then the net impact would be growth of about 5.6%. And actually the IMF subsequently refined its projections in July and now has about 5.8%, I believe, um, for the region. So actually the positive scenario has uh, luckily perhaps uh, is the one that's more come to pass. But of course, you know, we're still, there's still uncertainty out there uh, U.S. growth is very strong and maybe uh, monetary policy will still surprise us uh, in the U.S. going forward, which could have further implications in, in the region. Now, this stronger growth in the U.S. and China has provoked a sharp rise in commodity prices. Prices are now at or even above the COVID levels for several commodities. So, of course, this has helped the commodity exporters in, in the region. And growth expectations have been growing uh, quite strongly in the region. Um, if we can go to the next graph. So as you can see in this graph, these are the expectations for 2021 growth. Throughout the year, they've been growing. In fact, they may even exceed um, the 5.88% uh, of the IMF projections of, of July or our positive scenario. But again, there's uncertainty out there, so uh, we'll see what happens. Let me now turn to the fiscal positions. Uh, an achievement, if you will, of this crisis was that several countries managed to implement very significant fiscal packages in response to the crisis, including both above and below the line items as illustrated in this graph. The average package in the region was about 8.5% uh, of GDP. But that average is, actually, is heavily influenced by three countries, Brazil, Chile, and Peru, that had very large packages. And in fact, more than a third of IDB borrowers uh, 26 borrowing country members of the IDB had more limited packages of about 3% of GDP or, or less. And this compares to packages in advanced economies that averaged about 19% of GDP. So although three countries managed a very, very strong response to this uh, crisis and other countries were, were managed a, a reasonable response to this crisis, there were still constraints 
on other countries, given their um, fiscal positions or their access to, to financing. Still, as a consequence, primary fiscal deficits rose from about uh, a, a surplus of 0.5%, uh, sorry, deficits rose from a deficit of about 0.5% of GDP to almost 5.5%. And the overall fiscal deficits rose from 3% in 2019 to over 8% in 2020. So this is, uh, and, and interest payments have started to rise very significantly. Uh, countries are spending about 3% of GDP on interest payments. That's about 13% of public sector revenues. And now on average, countries are devoting about 5% of GDP just to service their debt. That's interest payments plus debt amortizations. That 5% of GDP is roughly twice the investment that infrastructure uh, of the infra investment in infrastructure in the region in recent years. Gross debt has then has risen. Um, it, it rose to about 72% of GDP by 2020. And we estimate that it could rise to a central in a central scenario to about 76% of GDP by 2023. Of course, if growth is somewhat stronger than expected, then uh, debt may not rise quite so quickly, or this may lead to a somewhat slower fiscal consolidation. So again, you know, there's uncertainty about these figures, which we've indicated in, in, in this graph. And in general terms, countries are trying to navigate this difficult path. On the one hand, supporting families and firms uh, without re, you know, re, uh, retrenching the fiscal support too quickly, but at the same time, trying to maintain fiscal sustainability. Of course, countries are in quite different positions, so the policy recommend recommendations will be different depending on, on the particular country characteristics. Eduardo will talk more about uh, recommendations to improve the fiscal outcomes, particularly in the medium term. Turning to monetary developments, another kind of achievement for the region was that central banks were able to assist governments during this crisis with, with strong counter cyclical measures. They reduced reserve requirements and extended liquidity to banks and to governments. And one way to illustrate that is through the expansion of central bank balance sheets. For three central banks, that expansion was over 10% of GDP and, and other cases were significant as well. <clears throat> At the same time, inflation had been brought down in many countries in the region and, and that stability allowed central banks to reduce the policy interest rates, so uh, interest rate policy could be uh, counter-cyclical. But inflation has been picking up, uh, and if we go to the next graph, you can see that uh, inflation has been picking up in, in many countries in the region uh, through to, uh, in more recent months. Now, broadly speaking, this is a good problem to have. It implies that demand has been picking up. As, uh, as we've seen, growth is now expected to be higher. And, and there are supply constraints, as there are in many other countries in the world. So it's not too surprising that we see inflation picking up. But it does, of course, create dilemmas for central banks, several of which have now started to increase their policy rates and pair back the expansion of the balance sheets and of the central banks. Clearly, this is also a balancing act. On the one hand, to control inflation and ensure that inflation expectations do not become de-anchored, but at the same time, not to stifle the economic recovery that is taking place. Uh, perhaps we can come back to this in the in the in the Q and A session afterwards. Now, the actions taken by central banks, in tandem with uh, public sector guarantee schemes, help to support credit, and as a result, actually, banks in most countries were able to increase their lending the non-financial private sector, as we see in this, in this graph. In contrast, perhaps, to the initial fiscal positions, the banking sector came into this crisis with very strong indicators, with both high capital and high liquidity ratios. Another real achievement of the region has been the increased solidity of the financial sectors. But policies implemented during the pandemic were certainly very useful to uh, cushion the impacts of the crisis. But loan moratoria and loan reprogramming implemented in most countries may still be hiding. Well, standard balance sheet indicators reflect regulatory flexibility. We then also estimated more market measures of risk uh, using stock market prices to estimate sometimes what are called um, probabilities of default or probabilities of capital deficiency, uh, which is perhaps a more appropriate term 
thinking about banks. I'm not going to go into the, the methodology of, 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 of this, as uh, some of you who, who know about option pricing may, may, may have come across this, but let me just say a couple of things about, about the results. You can see that according to this measure of risk, risk rose quite substantially back in March of 2020 when the, with the onset of the crisis. Uh, Latin America and the Caribbean is, is depicted here uh, by the yellow line and the thicker yellow line in the graph. But we compare Latin America and the Caribbean with other regions in the world. Uh, but you can see that after, uh, the, after 2020, then these probabilities of capital deficiency uh, start to fall. They start to fall more strongly in, in, in North America and uh, in advanced economies. They also fall in Latin America and the Caribbean but do not fall back to the uh, levels that we saw pre-COVID. So there may be something of a disconnect between these market measures and the more traditional balance sheet measures of risk, given the types of uh, regulatory flexibility or uh, uh, policies that have been implemented. So there may be some risk still hiding in financial sectors that we will see as uh, these uh, loan moratoria and guarantee schemes uh, expire. Turning to firms, corporate debt has risen very, very strongly across the world in Latin America. Uh, actually, it's risen slightly more in Latin America than in other regions. However, spending on new capital investment has fallen. So firms have, have, have accumulated significant cash balances to cover operational expenses and prepare for further losses from, from the shock. Um, and actually, some interesting data from the World Bank shows that actual firm closures, perhaps not as large as you might first think, uh, uh, but we will see in the recovery how many firms that certainly reduce their activities uh, and, and uh, 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 reduce their, their uh, employment and so forth uh, uh, manage to come back, which will depend critically also on the reallocation in our economies that Eduardo will touch on in the next, in the next part of the presentation. But let me finish my part by talking very briefly about the external accounts. And there's a lot more about trade and about capital flows in the report. But suffice to say that it, it, this, uh, this crisis was very different to previous crises. Uh, exports fell during this crisis, but imports actually fell by more, and current account debt deficits uh, narrowed somewhat. Um, and, and in fact, rather few countries uh, lost access to uh, um, capital markets. And, and in fact, there was a record uh, issuance of bonds, both by sovereigns and corporates, uh, by the end of 2020. Um, and so actually, if you look at what's happened to reserves, reserves during this crisis actually rose. So it has some characteristics that are quite different in this crisis to others. Um, but once again, you know, there's uncertainty still out there. Uh, there's now concern that the Federal Reserve may um, start to taper and start to think about raising interest rates more quickly. And again, of course, that may uh, um, have a, a sharp impact on the access to, to capital markets, uh, or at least on the interest rate uh, that countries need to pay. So there, this uncertainty will have to monitor going forward. Let me now pass the microphone to Eduardo, who will talk more about the recommendations in the report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to join this distinguished panel uh, today. There are a number of policy recommendations uh, that uh, we put forth in the report. I will talk about recommendations related to fiscal issues uh, first, and then about recommendations related to opportunities to boost sustainable growth. In terms of fiscal policy, one of the biggest opportunities for the region comes from simply spending better. Improving public spending efficiency could uh, liberate significant fiscal resources. We estimate that up to 4.4% of GDP could be saved per year on average across countries and more in countries with high spending levels. This requires, for example, eliminating leakages in social transfers, meaning improving targeting so the resources reach only to those whom the transfers are intended to benefit, and eliminating an estimated 1.4% of GDP 
that is spent on wasteful procurement processes for goods, services, and public investments. The region also continues to suffer from inefficient tax design and implementation with considerable avoidance and evasion. We estimate that if the region matched the tax effort of advanced economies, which would imply increasing the percentage of effective tax collection from 60 to 77% of the potential tax collection, then revenues would increase by 7% of GDP on average. In addition, there is room to increase the tax base in many countries. At 22% of GDP, tax revenues on average are considerably lower than the OECD's 34%. In many countries, a large portion of this revenues gap is explained by poor enforcement. In other countries, more comprehensive tax reforms to be implemented when the recovery is fully underway may still be warranted. And tax expenditures, which are the exemption given on certain taxes to certain groups, are very high at almost 4% of GDP. These should be reduced, if not phased out entirely, as they are generally distortionary and regressive. We estimate that no less than 84% of tax expenditures end up benefiting the non-poor. Countries could use these savings or additional revenues to increase spending on high quality health and education projects uh, for the benefit of poorer families, or to reduce import tariffs on capital goods to enhance the much needed private investment, or to address higher poverty rates in the aftermath of COVID-19 through well-targeted additional transfer uh, programs or to increase investment on well-selected public investment projects, for example, in infrastructure. Multipliers of infrastructure investment are as high as two, meaning that for every peso spent, GDP may grow up to two pesos. There's also a series of structural reforms countries should consider implemented to support the recovery. One is reducing informality, which is a serious problem that affects about half of the workers or even more across countries in the region and impacts both productivity and tax revenues. In the report, we discuss how the region can implement labor income tax credit programs. For example, similar to the earned income tax credit EITC here in the United States. The main advantage of those programs is that they would reward formality rather than subsidize informality, which has usual, usually been an unintended consequences of social policies in the region. To successfully implement fiscal reforms, we need the right institutions with a focus on long-term planning and the quality of spending. There are three that have proven to be exceptionally useful in other countries, but are still uncommon in the region a quality of spending unit within the government, a congressional budget office, and a productivity or evaluation commission. The combination of better spending, tax reform, and strengthening fiscal institutions can improve fiscal outcomes, helping countries navigate the way out of these challenging times and resume economic growth. There is also a series of opportunities countries should take advantage of to achieve greater sustainable growth. One has to do with the reorganization of global supply chains. During the COVID crisis, some 56.5 uh, billion or 6.1% of total US imports of intermediate goods switched to new source countries. As a comparison, Latin America and the Caribbean currently exports only about 26 billion US dollars worth of intermediate goods to the United States. This is an opportunity, particularly for small and medium sized exporters in the region. However, the truth is that Latin America and the Caribbean has not been able to tap on this opportunity. 
the region's share of US imports of intermediate goods actually dropped as exporters, especially small and medium-sized firms, find it difficult to participate in global value chains on a consistent basis. Deepening regional integration should be a top priority. Harmonizing rules and ironing out inconsistencies in existing trade agreements could help boost regional value chains. This would then help firms compete in global supply chains as well. Building strong business relationships is key to helping firms take advantage of global and regional value chains. Exporters often rely on imported intermediate inputs tailored to specific needs, which demand a significant investment by the trading partners. Therefore, when an exporter loses an existing provider, it takes time to search and successfully establish a new relationship. As this figure shows, the larger the fraction of suppliers that were lost during COVID, the more negative was the impact on firms' exports. For those firms that lost 20% of their suppliers, exports fell about 13%. On the other hand, firms that increased their suppliers by 20%, so exports grow 0.1%. A similar pattern emerges when looking at customers rather than suppliers. Given the importance of maintaining relationships and creating new ones, it is critical to support business networks. Policies that provide logistical support, reduce transaction costs, online networks that enable small and medium enterprises to connect with suppliers and clients, like for example, Connect Americas, a platform initially developed by the Inter-America Development Bank, and other policies that help overcome existing gaps through targeted investments, can strengthen the resilience of exporters' networks. The region also has the opportunity to address the long-standing low productivity growth problem. COVID-19 has generated more output losses among, la among labor-intensive sectors, which have been most impacted by changing consumption and production patterns due to social distancing. These are sometimes called the highly contact intensive sectors as well. Labor intensive sectors are more malleable as we call them in the report, meaning that they will likely recover faster. And indeed, there is evidence not shown here that they are recovering fast in many countries. But they are also less productive on average and therefore they contribute less to aggregate productivity growth and to long run or potential GDP growth. The challenge then is to use the crisis as an opportunity whereby they recover better to higher productivity levels, leading to higher potential growth. Despite the unprecedented nature of the COVID-19 pandemic, the disproportionate differential impact across sector is a common feature of crisis. We have analyzed the aftermath of systemic crises affecting the region over the last three decades. While those were mostly financial crises, the pattern is very similar. The table shows that the labor intensive sectors sustain larger output losses than capital intensive sectors, and they also recover faster. Yet the evidence shows that crises have typically been followed by persistent losses to total factor productivity, what we economists call TFP across sectors. And these losses in turn have implications to long run growth. What we find is that TFP growth after the crisis is systematically slower among the capital intensive high productivity sectors. This implies that sectors with the highest average productivity levels suffer more persistent TFP losses than other sectors during the recovery phase. This is a cycle that we should try to reverse. To recover better to higher levels of aggregate productivity, countries should increase investment in sectors with spillovers, so productivity can increase across all economic sectors. A case in point is infrastructure. 
Investing in infrastructure helps to build up or to improve a country's transport, energy, sanitation, and telecommunication assets with positive spillovers to other economic sectors. Increasing investment in infrastructure can boost productivity and growth. For example, if countries could increase productivity in infrastructure-related sectors to the levels of OECD countries through more and better investments, then economy-wide productivity could increase by 0.6 percentage points per year, which is 75% more than what uh, the region has achieved in the past. And according to estimates uh, that we presented uh, in a flagship that was published last year focusing on infrastructure, countries could also boost GDP by an average of 3.5 percentage points over a 10-year period if they take advantage of digitalization to increase infrastructure efficiency. This represents approximately 200 billion US dollars of incremental output over 10 years. These benefits may be as high as four and five percentage points of incremental growth in some countries. There is also, sorry, I shut down the video. There is also another crisis facing the region which has not disappeared, namely the planet's climate. We argue that it is even more urgent to tackle the risks of climate change now because with the pandemic, social and economic conditions have deteriorated and left the region much more vulnerable to climate shocks. However, this crisis also represents an opportunity. Technology has moved on and we no longer need to choose between growth and climate goals. Investing in sustainable infrastructure constitutes a win-win strategy and it reduces climate risks while boosting economic growth. Let me be precise here. Investing in sustainable infrastructure means focusing on expanding renewable electricity capacity and electricity grids, expanding the use of electric vehicles, expanding mass transit, and improving energy efficiency in the residential, commercial, and industrial sectors. According to estimates presented in the report, implementing sustainable infrastructure plans could add 1.3 percentage points of incremental growth in Latin America and the Caribbean and create 15 million additional jobs by 2030. And as the example of the Costa Rican decarbonization plan shows, the benefits of investing in sustainable infrastructure far outweigh the costs. The Costa Rican plan establishes a timeline for public transport to progressively switch to electric or hydrogen vehicles by 2050 and identifies immediate regulatory changes needed by 2023 to enable that. Implementing this plan will bring 41 billion US dollars in net benefits to Costa Rica between 2020 and 2050, equivalent to boosting growth by 0 0.4 percentage points. So while the months ahead will be challenging, this report details a set of uh, policies that should help countries realize a stronger recovery, not just to the low growth rates of the pre-pandemic period, but to higher rates of growth that the region needs to improve living standards. This presentation is only a short summary of what's in the report. I invite all of you to download the full report in the link that's available in the screen and also in the chat. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to Marla's and Andres' comments and the subsequent discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eduardo. Thank you, uh, Andy. If I could uh, pass over now to Tamala uh, and then perhaps segue straight into Andres uh, for some comments, provocations, questions uh, for for the bank, uh, or uh, or put some ideas out in the into the air for us to chew on uh, uh, subsequently. Uh, Marla, over to you. Thank you, Gareth, and. 
My thanks also to the IDB for preparing this report. If it weren't for you guys, we won't be seeing this kind of analysis and data on the Caribbean. So I really appreciate it. And so I, I, I want to just share my thoughts now on what was presented in this report, um, especially as it relates to the Caribbean. Of course, it's a report that covers Latin America and the Caribbean, but my, um, my world is really the Caribbean in, in, as it relates to this report. And I just want to highlight something that Eric said in the opening. He described the pandemic as an unprecedented triple sudden stop with major simultaneous disruptions in humanity human mobility, sorry, trade and capital flows. And he said, this was immensely dangerous. And those words really resonated with me, immensely dangerous. I've not seen anybody describe it like that, but it's, I couldn't have said it better myself. And in the Caribbean, only Trinidad and Tobago and Suriname had ever seen shocks worse than this pandemic before. And that was in the 1980s in Trinidad for the oil price shock. Um, 1990, an attempted coup d'etat in Trinidad, and in Suriname, a successful coup d'etat in 1991. Everybody else in the Caribbean did not experience a shock as bad as this before. And while Latin America, as you heard, while Latin America and Caribbean region has only 8% of the global population, we accounted for 25% of the deaths from this pandemic. And one of the other things that stuck with me from this report is the fact that the global average shows that there is an inverse relationship between economic growth and death rates. But many countries in the region and, and the data actually show Belize and Bahamas as, as the ones worst affected in this regard, they saw relatively weak growth alongside relatively high rates of death. So in other words, there was no trade-off between lives and livelihoods which was quite um, shocking for me to see in the data. And this was a major takeaway in the report for me. Also as discussed, poverty has been significantly impacted and we expect to see extreme poverty increase from 12.1% to 14.6%. And I have noted the Bahamas and Trinidad and Tobago in particular discuss adjustments to their tax regime, in particular the value added tax in order to alleviate the burden on the poor. But I just wanted to share what this report found in relation to that. This report found the, that there are significant leakages in social transfers and tax expenditures as just discussed. And the relatively common practice of reducing value added taxes on some critical items holds the record in terms of leakages. And I just want to repeat, it was said earlier, but I would repeat it, no less than 84% of these tax expenditures, 84% end up benefiting the non-poor. Energy subsidies also account for large leakages with 81% of energy subsidies benefiting the non-poor. This is something that's very important, especially in Trinidad and Tobago, my country. And I think if policymakers are serious about poverty alleviation, they need to first look at how their social programs are targeted, how regressive their taxation regimes are, and how weak their public procurement frameworks are. And all of that is discussed in the report. Pension and health spending has also risen steadily, driven by rapid aging of the population and exacerbated by the pandemic. But how are we in the Caribbean dealing with aging populations and also populations that are not aging healthy? I also note that no Caribbean country was found in this analysis to have capital and current expenditure multipliers greater than or equal to one. Trinidad and Tobago and Barbados were found to have capital and current expenditure multipliers of about 0 0.4. What does this mean? It means that for every dollar of government's capital spending and recurrent expenditure, only 40 cents, around 40 cents gets added to GDP. That's a fiscal leakage of about 60 cents on the dollar. And what does this mean? It means that we cannot tax and spend our way out of this crisis or any economic crisis for that matter. Also striking in the report was that remittances 
which are a huge support for most of the vulnerable, um, has been very buoyant, of course, because of the stimulus measures in the developed world. And among the countries for which annual remittances exceed 5% of GDP, we have Belize, Dominican Republic, Haiti, and Jamaica. The annual growth rates of remittances increased to 6.2% in the second quarter of last year and 7.8% in the third quarter, which are huge um, support for especially those the, uh, most vulnerable in our societies. Another major takeaway for me was the fact that there isn't a trade-off between growth and environmental sustainability. And I quote, many studies stress the social and economic benefits of the transition to a net zero economy. In the United States, the transition to net zero will create between half a million to 1 million net energy jobs by 2030. And in Europe, 2 million net new jobs by 2030 and 5 million by 2050. The Global Commission on the Economy and Climate found that bold climate action globally could deliver a direct economic gain of 26 trillion US dollars by 2030, mainly in the form of energy savings. And in terms of our recovery, we know we all need to invest in vaccine uptake because those who can vaccinate to operate will get on with life and they will recover faster. We need to invest in climate adaptation and we need to invest in sustainable and renewable energy. And then there is our global thrust towards decarbonization, which was discussed at length in the report. And this is an imperative. Our very survival depends on it, especially in the small Caribbean island states. But in the Caribbean, we also have Guyana, the world's newest oil producer, and recently having revised its oil equivalent proven reserve number two, wait for it, 10 billion barrels of oil. And this just might make them the 17th highest level of proven oil reserves in the world. And this is with a population of about 800,000 people. Guyana is still, however, the poorest country in the English speaking Caribbean per, by per, per capita GDP and has struggled with economic development for decades. Net zero, therefore, is unlikely to be their priority. And I'm putting this here and saying this to say that, that what recovery looks like for Barbados, for example, is not what it would look like for Guyana. Likewise, Trinidad and Tobago is in a vastly different place than Jamaica. The policy prescriptions for recovery are not one size fits all across the Caribbean. We are too diverse. But all of us need to understand that this is a whole new world and the old ways of doing things are not working and will not work in the future. And we have to do things very, very differently. Consistent with the findings in this report, I look forward to seeing the policy interventions in the Caribbean to support much needed climate adaptation investment and net zero targets as our very survival depends on it. I thank you. It may be my turn. Should I just uh, launch? All right, Gareth. Launch was... away. Launch away. Thank you. I was waiting for some uh, wink from someone, but uh, um, happy to be a part of this panel. Thank you to the IDB for a great report and uh, an enduring partnership with the LSE. Uh, I am particularly uh, happy to be part of this event because of the three IDB experts on the panel, two had the misfortune of being my students at some point in life, and uh, I, I, I do hope it did not do much harm. Um, uh, but judging from a very, very high quality of the report, I am reasonably confident uh, on those grounds. So congratulations, guys. And also thank you, Marla, for a very rich uh, uh, and very relevant set of remarks. I want to say a few things about Eduardo's points, and I want to say a few things about Andy's points. 
and then at the very end, perhaps mention one or two topics which the report only touches tangentially, but which seem to me to be absolutely key when thinking about recovery, uh, and more importantly, when thinking about sustained and sustainable growth in the region. Let me begin by um, spending a minute on something Andy said in passing, which, but which it seems to me requires further reflection. Long before we get to the macroeconomics, we should acknowledge that the public health performance of the region was absolutely dismal. Uh, eight of the 20 countries with the highest deaths per capita in the world happen to be in Latin America. And Latin America certainly does not have one third of the countries in the world, uh, which is another way of saying that we are very, very overrepresented in the very top of the countries with excess deaths. And last time I checked, Peru was number one in the world, Brazil was in the top five. Exactly why that is, I am not entirely sure. One can repeat the obvious things. Poverty, pre-existing health conditions, weak health infrastructure, insufficient uh, enforcement and respect for health directives. The list is long, but uh, I think this is one area where further research by institutions like the IDB uh, should be uh, very productive. Because even countries which spent a lot of money and which vaccinated a lot of people, like Chile, or even countries which in the beginning of the cycle were looking pretty good, like Uruguay, in the end tend, you know, ended up being mediocre performance. Uruguay and Chile are above, above the average of Latin America, did much better. But even in those countries, if you compare them to other middle-income countries in the world, performance is nothing to be proud of. So I, I put that out there as something which I think you know, is, is, is calling out for further exploration. On macroeconomics, we have some good news. If uh, 12 years ago, when the world financial crisis uh, erupted, only one country, Chile, was in a position to carry out strong counter-cyclical fiscal and monetary policy, this time around, lots of countries did. Peru did, Brazil did, uh, Colombia to some extent did, um, Mexico didn't for reasons that uh, I think also remain to be uh, explored. But clearly there was more room on the fiscal front, there was more credibility on the monetary front, and that set of fiscal and monetary rules and institutions made a more aggressive uh, response uh, feasible. I mean, as Andy said, and I want to underlie this, this may be the, the first big crisis that hits Latin America, which in turn does not trigger a financial crisis in the region. Um, countries remained, the countries that ha had access to world capital markets remained uh, enjoying that access then we've seen no default so far. We've seen no runs on banks. We've seen no wild gyrations in asset prices. That is very good news. Before we get too excited, however, uh, about macro performance, let me just mention a couple of bad news and a puzzle also. One item of bad news, again, Andy hinted at it, but I want to dwell on it a, a bit more, is that the average is always misleading, but in this case, the average is particularly misleading. A handful of countries really had the room to do very aggressive counter-cyclical counter fiscal, and really only three. Peru and Chile ended up, you know, began the crisis with very low public debt to GDP ratios and took advantage of that. Brazil and, you know, went into the crisis with actually pretty high debt to GDP ratios but was blessed with a huge domestic financial market uh, and as a result was able to borrow. What is true of those three countries is not really true of the rest of the region. One country which could have done a lot more and didn't is Mexico. Uh, why Mexico didn't, uh, I do not understand. I am told it has something to do with the fact that the president doesn't like credit cards, whether that is a you know, believable explanation or not, I do not know, but Me Mexico could have done more, should have done more. A left-wing president 
refuse to engage in countercyclical fiscal policy, go figure. Why that is, I have no idea. But the other point that uh, uh, emerges from these figures is that uh, a number of countries in Latin America simply did not have the room to do more. Um, you know, my friend Mauricio Cárdenas, uh, the former finance minister of Colombia, likes to say that rich countries did whatever it takes, emerging and developing countries did whatever they could afford. That uh, very pithy saying also applies within Latin America. Uh, Brazil, Peru, Chile, maybe one or two others did whatever it takes because they had the room. Uh, many others did not. Simply, they not, did not have the room. So we should not simply uh, um, declare victory here and conclude that everybody has the fiscal institutions and the fiscal space to do countercyclical policy. The truth is that only three or four countries do. The puzzle in my mind, and here I would really like to hear Andy's and Eduardo's views, is if countries did not lose access to the world capital market, and if countries enjoyed the ability to borrow from the IDB, from the World Bank, from the IMF, why is it that current account deficits narrowed? In the standard model that we teach our students, you know, if you are suffering a shock today and you will be richer tomorrow than you are today, you should in fact smooth consumption, smooth investing by borrowing. In the previous crisis in Latin America, that happened, that, that did not happen. The model did not hold because you couldn't borrow. So, you know, you had current account deficits uh, narrowing simply because you had no choice. This time around, countries did have a choice. And nonetheless, the current account deficit uh, narrowed. So is it again uh, an issue of, uh, of, of averages? Uh, and so we should not put Peru and Chile with the other countries uh, in the same bag. Is it that um, countries didn't really have as much uh, um, room to borrow as some of the numbers suggest? Is it that maybe they could have, but there's still a lot of stigma you know, associated with doing things like going to the fund. And as a result, not many countries drew from the fund. What's going on here? Why is it that we do things better? We have better rules. We have access to the world capital market. The IMF has a bunch of new, new facilities. And nonetheless, we still have such a big contraction and uh, a current account moving in exactly the opposite direction to what good policy and good theory would suggest. That, in my mind, remains a puzzle. Uh, if you ask the IMF, the IMF will say, oh, we had the money. We were ready to lend. Is that, you know, the supply, you know, the, the supply was there. The demand for borrowing was not there. It strikes to me that cannot be quite right. You know, if I'm if I'm running an ice cream shop and I only have three flavors and nobody wants to buy my ice cream, well, it's my problem. It's not the consumer's problem. If the IMF has three kinds of ice cream and nobody wants that kind of ice cream, well, perhaps we need a different kind of ice cream. I mean, you cannot put the blame squarely on the borrowers who didn't borrow. There is still a lingering problem there of access to money when you really need it. Last thing that I want to say on macro is that, um, are we going to have a debt crisis? I have no idea, but clearly the combination of much higher public debt, much higher private debt, shortening debt maturities and rising world interest rates is not a pretty picture. Uh, and of course, again, the average is very misleading because you know having 40 points of GDP in public debt is not the same thing as having 90 uh, points of GDP. One also has to be a little bit careful uh, about exactly what these numbers say. In Brazil, a lot of the public debt is in fact in the hands of, of other public entities. You have to do a lot of cleaning to figure out exactly how much debt is truly outstanding. But what is true in several countries, and Brazil is the poster child of this, is that as, as interest rates begin to rise, average maturity of debt begins to fall. And what we do know from, from, from the country where Eduardo was born and Andy lived for many years is that you know, the shortening of maturities of public debt gets you into a lot of trouble, or at least makes you very, very vulnerable. Argentina went through that two or three years ago. Many other countries have gone through that uh, a million times before. That is something that really worries me as I look at Latin America today. Let me move on to some of the very important issues uh, that Eduardo highlighted. 
Um, let me begin by saying that I welcome the focus on productivity and long-term growth. Uh, because Latin America is so good at getting into short-term trouble, we tend to disregard the, the long-term issue. But you know, just as, as we did very badly when it comes to public health, the truth is that we all do very badly when it comes to long-term growth and productivity, everybody. You know, Eric and I are from Chile. Chile used to be the poster child for high productivity, high growth. That, my friends, is the past. Nobody today in the region, nobody is displaying high productivity growth and has, you know, uh, rising sustainable growth trends. So the question is why? That is not a question that I can tackle, uh, much less answer in the next five minutes, but it seems to be that's the huge elephant in the room that we need to be thinking about. And in that vein, and given that I don't have a lot more time, let me just say three things that, uh, that are connected to some of the, uh, of the proposals that, um, that Eduardo made. Uh, proposal number one is that um, you know, we should be thinking about restructuring public spending. And here, uh, in response to that, I have one word of skepticism and one word of endorsement. My skepticism is related to the political economy of getting rid of what Eduardo called inefficient expenditure. Um, um, been there, done that. Those of us who spent some time in, um, in ministries of finance, you know, we would like to think that, um, that you know, every year governments begin from a blank slate, choose good expenditure, discard bad expenditure. But the truth is, of course, is that a lot of this expenditure is in there by law. Secondly, it has you know, big defenders and powerful constituencies that happen to be uh, unwilling to cut that. And you know, the obvious uh, you know, exhibit A, of course, is um, energy subsidies. You know, Macri in Argentina had a very difficulty getting rid of, you know, great difficulty getting rid of them. Many other countries have as well. So in the current political environment, and I'll say a word or two about politics in the end, I think that's that's pretty unlikely. The thing that I do want to endorse enthusiastically that Eduardo said, and which strikes me as absolutely key, is. If we're going to spend more, and we should spend more to fight exclusion and inequality, EITC is the way to go. UBI is not the way to go. I mean, if I could say that in capital letters, uh, uh, and if I could jump up and down to emphasize that, uh, I would. Uh, but we are uh, you know, hosting this from the UK and that would not be a, a deemed appropriate behavior. Um, but this is a really key point. We have done way too much to create systems of social welfare, which in the end create citizens of different categories. Some of whom have access to the formal labor market, have benefits, uh, and as a result can look forward to fairly stable lives and too many people that are left out of the formal labor market that have short-term jobs, volatile jobs, badly paid jobs, and very little access to social wealth, welfare benefits. The name of the game has to be bringing more people into the 21st century when it comes to labor institutions and some kind of, kind of a wage subsidy, some kind of an EITC is exactly the way to go. When Eric and I were in the Chilean government, we did a bit of that. Uh, it's very expensive, so inevitably you want to start small. Um, you can target it. There's no reason why you couldn't target it on priority groups, young unemployed people, young informally uh, 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 employed people, women, etc. Uh, you could target it because clearly you cannot do a full-fledged EITC for everybody uh, overnight. But this is, in my mind, this is priority number one, two, and three in Latin America when it comes to fighting uh, inequality and exclusion. The other thing that I want to say is that, uh, you know, the, the emphasis, uh, when we talk about growth and productivity, uh, I'm just going to highlight them because Eduardo uh, was very clear on them, and I just want to say how important they are. Value chains and green growth have to be the two, uh, the, you know, the, the two um, headlines in our discussion of how we enhance productivity. Uh, South America, we have to be careful here, South America is not the same as the Caribbean, Central America, and Mexico. 
uh, the Caribbean, Central America, and Mexico are integrated into the North American value chain, some more than others, Mexico massively so. South America is not. We are the only region of the world, along with Sub-Saharan Africa, that does not participate in any substantial way in any major value chain. And that is a huge hindrance when it comes to diversifying exports. So Eduardo said it right. I have little to um, add there, but uh, this is a huge subject matter that we should be uh, emphasizing. And similarly with green growth, um, you know, it is good news that we can think uh, about being greener and growing. And of course, the one thing that will make us be greener and grow is investment. Um, technology has changed a lot. There is going to be, I think, a fair bit of um, financing from multilaterals, I hope, touch wood, knock on wood, for uh, different kinds of green infrastructure investment. So this is low hanging fruit. This is, you know, this is a complete, you know, uh, a winner on every dimension. Um, the key thing is to, you know, and this is a message for Washington, not just for the IDB. The key way to do this, of course, is to structure international financing in ways that is not necessarily debt creating. Are there ways in which you can bring in the private sector? Some of it may be equity for the low income countries. Some of it may be grants, et cetera. Uh, but we need to do more of this in a way that will not simply create a larger debt burden for the middle income countries. Because as Andy said, there's only so much more debt that we can take. The last word that I want to add is simply on politics. Um, we have been having a wonderful, productive and interesting technocratic uh, discussion. Problem is in Latin America nowadays, technocratic discussions are the devil incarnate. Um, you know, we've been using technocratic language that alone makes us suspect. Uh, I just want to say in parting that I have been around policy and political debates in Latin America for about 30 years now. I have never seen a political environment that is so nasty, so focused on the short term, and so inclined toward demagoguery, populism, and polarization. And that is pretty much true of every country that I know, including my own. And as a result, the other elephant in the room is whether we can get some of these very interesting uh, proposals from the IDB onto the policy debate in a climate that is anything but receptive to sensible, sensible policy uh, propositions. A number of countries have very, very um, tough, competitive, polarized, and, and, you know, and, uh, and uncertain elections coming up. I'm thinking of my own country, Brazil, Colombia, among others, in the next 12 months. Maybe after the dust settles, we should revisit some of these issues. Uh, in the current political environment, I'm really pretty pessimistic about uh, finding much room for policy innovation. But uh, you know, the good thing about polarization is that eventually it comes to an end. You know, the big question is, of course, when? And my answer is, I have no idea. Let me stop there. Thank you very much. And again, guys, congratulations for a wonderful report. Thank, thank you, Andres. Um, in, in your, and Marla, uh, in, in your comments, there was a sort of uh, provocation of a puzzle, um, which uh, either Eduardo or Andy, if you uh, can, uh, go through the memory bank that a few minutes perhaps you could respond to to andres's uh puzzle but let me also just uh throw into the mix a couple of questions um that i've been getting through uh the uh the platform here and some other media as well um uh, and see particularly between andy eduardo uh who wants to take any of these uh, points on uh the, the first one perhaps uh is is the sort of the devil's advocate uh question another one to add somewhat to andres's or, uh, already quite long list uh which i mean ultimately is given also partly what you said in your presentation are most latin america countries not ultimately going to bet the house on a further commodity boom as the world unlocks and certainly in some of those social measures that we know the connection between cash transfer programs and, and some other redistributive and even uh, some of the human capital education programs, et cetera, that took place over the last 20 or so years, that that is going to be the key part, kind of policy trigger, uh, both for sort of fiscal surpluses and, and sort of other revenue uh, opportunities. So 
perhaps you might respond to that. They'll use that certainly in the short term if, if it happens uh, to a greater extent than it already seems to be happening. And then perhaps some of the things that you, you signal in the report will be more sort of medium term uh, adaptations. Uh, another question you might want to get your teeth into uh, from the platform is around, uh, and I'm, I'm going to cut these down really short and pithy, uh, but provoked by the sort of Pandora Papers uh, leaks in the last couple of days, uh, perhaps is tackling sort of tax evasion on a sort of international scale, um, something which uh, needs much greater attention uh, to some of the sort of uh, fiscal other issues that you've uh, put forward here. And perhaps you could sort of address that. Uh, there's also a question really around sort of, if you're going to be investing in infrastructure, uh, as you sort of uh, put in the report and in the presentation, then infrastructure of the past is, and, and the sort of, uh, the, the, the sort of diligence that went into contracting of infrastructure investments uh, and some of the procurements, et cetera, is possibly not the way forward for infrastructure in, in the near future, uh, particularly if it's going to be sustainable uh, in, in a variety of different ways. So, you know, could you say something about the sort of examples uh, or, or sort of pathways of regulatory reform, um, public procurement frameworks that you'd like to see? If you're going to see this infrastructure uh, investment sort of as a, as a way forward. Uh, and again, to sort of boil down a question or part of a question uh, in the chat, there's, and I guess in a way it sort of re relates to something that Eduardo also said about trade integration uh, and the networks and the security of those networks trading practices in, in the last uh, few years. But where do you see sort of small medium economic enterprises uh, in the economic recovery, in the trade integration, in the productivity curves that you'd like to see, and, and how can, it's been around for as a debate for uh, decades, millennia probably, but you know how can you see in the sort of post recovery period, uh, a real sort of small medium enterprise led recovery rather than one that relies much more heavily on on the large conglomerates uh, that are very much sort of already locked into the system uh, and are perhaps not where the, the big innovations are going to come uh, to sort of adapt to new economic opportunities either within the region or, or, uh, or beyond. So at least three or four questions there. Uh, I'll pass the microphone to Andy perhaps first, uh, Andres's puzzle or any of the other uh, conundrums that have come through questions. I've got more than three questions, there, but I'll, I'll start with you. Maybe also Eric would like to come in as well on some of them. Um, well, first, let me thank both uh, Mahler and Andres. I mean, uh, fantastic uh, discussion from both of you. So thank you. Thank you so much for your, for your comments. Um, I wanted to make one just very quick comment on something Marla said about the low multipliers, because uh, I mean, there, there is clearly a range of multipliers that actually sort of relates also to something that Gareth asked, no? And, um, you know, we really, although it's clear that multipliers are in, on investment are higher than the multipliers on um, on current expenditure, the multi, uh, and, 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 you know, we say this in the report and, and actually in a previous report, our flagship on infrastructure that we, uh, Eduardo and I and uh, another colleague of ours also uh, helped uh, coordinate it. Um, you know, it's still the case that a lot of infrastructure and investment is very inefficient. So these multipliers ought to be a lot higher. So we need to, you know, invest in the investment process to ensure that uh, we do have efficient investment in infrastructure and that these multipliers are actually a lot higher. And I think that relates to something that Gareth also mentioned. So um, thanks. So let me um, have a go at uh, Andres's puzzle. I'm assuming the one that you mean is about the um, uh, how come the current account narrowed, et cetera. I assume that's the, the puzzle that Gareth's referring to. I mean, I think there is something of the, the problem of the averages, because I think countries are, uh, there are different experiences across, across the region. That's point number one. Point number two, I mean, there was a huge, so what we had was two countervailing forces, right? We had a, um, a huge increase in private savings, actually. I mean, there was very clear uh, increase in demand for liquidity from households, firms. I mean, everywhere you look in the private sector, 
huge demand um, for liquidity and, and um, you know, essentially increase in precautionary savings. And on the other hand, governments that were dissaving because they were, you know, deficits were, were going up. And, and so it's the balance of these two things, right, which, which then impacts the, the, the current account, et cetera. Um, and maybe, I mean, maybe some governments also had some fear of uh, dissaving too much, right? I mean, uh, you know, you mentioned the case of Mexico, but maybe others were also, I think, I suspect that others were also in that position. So all they, some may have had more access to capital than they actually realized or, 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 or certainly tried to, tried to exploit, um, you know, for their own reasons, which I guess, you know, probably comes back to some political economy reasons as, uh, you know, that, um, why politicians in some countries may be more aggressive and more risk-taking and and perhaps uh, processes uh, in other countries um, favor a more conservative uh, approach in, in terms of counter-cyclical policy. Um, but I mean, it, there, there were certainly a lot of countervailing forces. On the official side, I mean, actually, I think, you know, the, the, um, there were, I mean, huge increase in disbursements from both from the IMF, from the World Bank and, and from the IDB. So, so there clearly was a, a big official response. And actually in follow-up work that I've been doing with Eduardo and, and with another colleague, we've been looking at this in some detail because you know, relatively few countries actually suffered from a sudden stop in capital flows. But actually some countries did suffer from a sudden stop had it not been for um, the official sector coming in with, with funding or uh, even more countries if it had not been for their increased debt issuance, right? Um, which really played a strong role. So, but there were some countries in the category that would have had a sudden stop had it not been for the response from the official sector. So, so in that regard, the official sector, I think did play uh, an important role. Um, Gareth, you, you had, I mean, I, I can carry on a bit on, on infrastructure. I already mentioned this. I, I think, um, again, referring to our flagship from last year, there is a, a huge opportunity, but also a huge challenge, right? Um, and this thing refers to the question that was also in the chat, because on the one hand, I mean, it's really, we're facing a technological revolution and, and it's very hard, right? Because it's a technological revolution. So, you know, it's very, it's difficult to know what will be the outcome of this. It's really a disrupting force that's going on. And there's clearly a huge uh, tendency towards decentralization in some sectors. So energy being the most obvious, most obvious one. Uh, where you know we could all become sort of prosumers and have our solar panels, but also consume as well, uh, and and firms can produce electricity. I mean, much more economical for firms both to produce and and to consume now as before, but that poses a huge challenge then for the central market, right? So so getting this right, on the one hand, there'll be a lot of decentralization, and that could be very beneficial, and technology is making the access to renewables, et cetera, so much easier. But on the other hand, it's a big challenge for the central organizations. How do you organize the central energy market and so forth? And, and I think there will always be, you know, so we need this sort of flexible approach on the one hand, but on the other hand, we need to have a clear idea of what the central infrastructure is that we need. And I don't think there'll be any getting away from the fact that we'll need very strong um, central organization and central planning, in, you know, in uh, both of the road network and of the electricity network and the telecommunications network to be able to then allow decentralization among small players to, to flower. So we'll need this both this combination. Um, of course, the parallel to the internet is very, um, is pretty clear. And that's a big challenge, but the opportunities are also are also immense. Um, and we discussed this a bit in the in the flagship on infrastructure. Um, so I'll stop there because I'll let others. Um, Thanks, Andy. Um, always we're the victims of the clock, but um, we can run over just a few minutes just to sort of round things off um, for the for the benefit of podcasts in the future, at least. So, uh, Eduardo, I don't know if you want to come in on on any of the points uh, raised in response to Andres Mala. Uh, following up on Andy or, or any of the points that I raised from, from chat questions. Yes, absolutely. But let me just check if I should yield my time to Eric. Uh, maybe Eric wants to, to, to say something. Oh, you're fine. So thank you very much, uh, Marla. Thank you very much, Andres. Uh, it's really absolutely great comments and I really appreciate it. I, I always feel 
very uh, nervous when I present in a panel and Andres is in the audience because I always feel I'm I'm giving an exam again. So I'm 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 happy with with his comments to to know that uh, uh, I may have passed. So thank you, thank you for that to both. Let me just make very we uh, we um, very uh, quick comments on a couple of 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 the questions. Andy has covered uh, most of them um, very very well. Uh, so uh, this one point. Andres uh, raised on, on his comments about uh, his skepticism of how hard it is to get rid of some of these uh, inefficient spending. And, and of course I share, I, I, I totally understand uh, where, where that skepticism is, is, is coming from. I, I would just say um, a, a couple of things regarding uh, that. First, I think there is an importance in putting those numbers out and quantifying the extent of those uh, inefficiencies, because that information is really something that, uh, you know, uh, 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 strikes uh, uh, the magnitude of the problem we have on that dimension. And of course, average numbers are deceiving in this sense as well. We have countries in the region where the level of inefficiencies uh, exceeds seven, eight percent of uh, GDP. And you know there are some uh, cases that we are seeing, which are very interesting. Of sometimes, uh, you know, uh, politicians within uh, uh, different countries that are taking these uh, uh, numbers and 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 doing um, sort of campaigns on based on numbers that a institution like uh, like ours point out. So I think I think that uh, you know part of our role uh, in in doing this type of uh, research is putting those numbers out there because uh, I, I think that really helps in the in the policy um, debates. The second point I want to make regarding that is that there are some issues that shouldn't be all that contagious, con contentious uh, on, on the political front. For example, on the issue of social transfers, um, many times the leakages are because, uh, you know, we don't have good registries on who the recipients of the programs are. So there's a lot of targeting mistakes just because you know we don't have good information about who you know the legislator puts these transfers is intended to benefit certain groups but given that we don't have very good information of who the people are we you know the transfers end up uh, being received by a lot of people many of whom are not the intended uh, recipients i think with the digitalization, for example, and the digitalization of the registries and so on, is providing an opportunity that was just simply not there, say, 10, 15 years ago when many of these programs started to be developed. And the region still has a long way to go in terms of trying to incorporate some of those opportunities to improve the efficiency which with its expense. I want to say something on, on infrastructure. Andy already covered that uh, as well. I think that many of the problems that we have, and this is related to one of the questions in the chat about uh, regulation, the regulatory frameworks in Latin America continue to be the regulatory frameworks of the 1990s, where we still didn't have internet, right? So now we are talking about uh, digitalization. We are talking about uh, uh, the role of uh, information technology and so on, and we are seeing the uh, sectors as if they were operating under the rules of 30 uh, years ago. Clearly, we need updates and, 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 and the report that Andy mentioned uh, uh, on, on infrastructure services that we put out la last, uh, last year uh, points exactly in that um, uh, direction. And finally, on trading, trade integration and trading um, um, opportunities, there's a clearly an information mismatch here. Many of the uh, um, uh, uh, small and medium enterprises in, 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 in the region who produce goods and services that would be highly demanded in, um, in the current uh, con context and could participate in, in a much stronger fashion in, in, in global uh, value chains, just basically don't have the platforms to be able to connect with clients and, and, and suppliers. That's why we put so much emphasis in the need to help them get that information and, 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 and resolve that information asymmetry that is in many cases impend, imp impeding uh, the realization of those potential uh, uh, gains. 
So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eduardo. And uh, we've been beaten by the clock, as, as is usually the case when uh, the, there are so many issues there. Um, I, I learned a phrase the other day, polypandemic. Uh, there are so many different kind of combinations within the pandemic taking place at the current time beyond health, but also including climate change impacts, the economics, the fiscal that, that have been sort of uh, outlined so beautifully uh, in uh, the presentations here. Uh, and it looks like we need a sort of poly solutions. Uh, and I think what the report starts to open a pathway to is, is at least some of the potential uh, for those sort of solutions in the region moving forward. So uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, wonderful job uh, in producing the report. Uh, to pick up on a couple of points made by the uh, chat and, and other media, uh, we will be making a, a further uh, link available to the report through through uh, our, our platforms, etc. And of course, when the podcast comes out, as I hope it does in a few days' time, uh, then also the presentations and the uh, the report will be flagged uh, in that as well. So, uh, just final words for me of, of thanks mm -hmm. to. Uh, Andy to Eduardo for the presentations, to Marla and Andres for the for the comments, uh, Susanna, uh, Malcolm and Eric uh, for uh, the words of welcome at the start and for, for bringing this all together on your side as well. So with that, thank you everybody. Bye.